from Biored Headquarters and welcome to our gene editing podcast, part one, from mega towels to CRISPR, the many ways to edit a gene. I'm your host, Laura Moriarty, and in the Bioradiation studio, we have Jan Juveno. Welcome, Jan. Hi, Laura. So today we're asking Jan to give us a quick overview of the four main gene editing systems currently being employed in life sciences. But before we get started, Jan, can you give us a little bit about your background and your role here at Biorad? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm currently working at Biorad in our qPCR and genomics division. And uh, before that, I was very heavily involved, of course, in, uh, in R&D. In particular, I spent five years of my life at uh, Sangamo Biosciences, which was uh, a company, uh, which is a company, I should say, uh, that specializes in zinc finger proteins and their application. So really, you uh, could classify yourself as an expert. Ah, well, that sounds not very <laughs> modest, and I feel slightly uncomfortable saying so, but let's say that I do have some experience in uh, genome editing. Thanks, Sean. So here's our first question for you. Can you give us a little background on gene editing? You know, what is it? How long has it been used in life sciences? So back in my days in the lab when Earth was still soft, <laughs> the earliest forms of gene editing were basically, um, they were all based on homologous recombination, and which is basically the ability to exchange nucleotide sequences between, you know, similar pieces of DNA. This worked for a small number of models and, you know, cells such as mouse or yeast cells, where the frequency of recombination was high enough to make it possible. But even in those models, the process was extremely laborious. It was uh, highly variable and required a very time-consuming and stringent selection pr protocol. So, however, scientists already knew that they needed to be able to use this type of methods, and this need propelled the field of genome editing forward to, so that you know, people realized that the frequency of homologous recombination could actually be increased by targeting double-strand breaks inside the cells. And over the past 20 years, it is this discovery that has been the source of all the different methods that we currently use in what we call genome editing, the genome editing field. Got it. So what was the first or one, you know, can you give us an idea of some of the, the first targeted endonucleases that were discovered? Sure. So the first ones, to my recollection, were meganucleases. In spite of their cool name, uh, meganucleases, were also called homing endonucleases, which is a little more homely. <laughs> Uh, they were the first targeted endonucleases discovered, and they were kind of promising because of their target recognition side, which was between 14 and 40 base pairs, which basically warranted, uh, guaranteed a unique recognition side per genome. They also had the advantage of being relatively small in size, which basically allowed to uh, introduce them into a variety of cells with a variety of different vectors. And they were um, pretty efficient. I mean, you only needed a single protein to modify the genome. Any drawbacks? Of course. <laughs> they were actually pretty difficult to engineer. Therefore, if you were looking for a different gene or a different site in a gene to modify, that required very advanced protein engineering. And that's really what kept meganucleases from being widely adopted. They're related to them were the megatals. Really? Mega Towels? What a cool name. I know. It should be in an anime, uh, Japanese anime or something like that. It is a very <laughs> cool name. So Mega Towels combine the easy-to-design DNA binding domains from talents with the high cleavage efficiency of meganucleases in single chimeric proteins. Both Mega Towels and meganucleases are very promising for th therapeutic applications because of their compact size and high cleavage efficiency but they're less frequently used for research applications because of the previously mentioned design challenges. So what about the first gene editing tool to make it to clinical trials? Can you tell us about that? Of course I can, Laura. They were the zinc finger nucleases, and although they were the first to make it into clinical trials, they were a bit more difficult to control than we anticipated. They were the first targetable endonucleases that were relatively easy to design. These artificial nucleases combine DNA binding domains, called zinc fingers, and which are normally used by transcription factors to recognize the genes that they regulate, together with a nonspecific endonuclease domain, FOK1. 
Each zinc finger specifically recognizes three bases of DNA. By linking multiple zinc fingers of known specificity, the FOK1 nuclease can be targeted to a sequence of interest. Mm -hmm. To generate double-strand breaks, you need a pair of zinc finger nucleases to flank the desired cut site. At first, this system was promising because of the modular design, but zinc fingers proved to be a little more difficult to optimize than anticipated, mainly because the fingers are not truly independent from one another. The base pair recognition of one finger may be affected by its neighbor in a manner that is somewhat difficult to predict. Got it. So that's zinc fingers and meganucleases. What's next? You know, I've also heard about talons. Can you explain what they are? Well, of course. So talons are those ugly looking claws that are at the back of a rooster's foot. <laughs> um, is that what you were referring to? Yeah. Yeah, those ones. No, not really. I was thinking about gene editing for this one, but... Um, <laughs> oh, you mean <laughs> talents. True. Talents, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. All right, talents. So talents are, uh, stand for transcription, act transcription activator-like effector nucleases. Well, no wonder <laughs> they're called talents. Yeah, it's a little shorter. Yeah. And the advantage of talons is that they are truly modular. You know, compared to zinc finger nucleases where you have to, uh, you know, com combine three base pairs at a time, talons can actually be designed to recognize single bases. So they um, actually use a 35 to 33 amino acid repeat in their protein that is specific for one single base at a time. So you can see that you know, instead of trying to combine the different triplets that you have in your uh, zinc finger uh, repertoire and, you know, praying that you find that sequence in your <laughs> promoter or your mm -hmm. gene, you can actually go into any sequence that you like and design the talent for that. So that's really their main advantage. Got it. They also use, similarly to uh, the zinc finger nucleases, a FOK1 uh, Nucle restriction uh, domain. So that allows them to bind to the uh, enzyme, to the DNA, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and the enzyme will cleave the DNA. So how does the size of these talons compare to other gene editing systems? So there is a problem because if you uh, envision a 33 to 35 amino acid repeat for every single base pair and you have to have a Recognition site, in order to be unique or relatively unique, has to be at least 12 base pair long. You can see how quickly these proteins can grow. And yeah. the more specific you are, the more uh, modules you have to attach together. Got it. So um, most talents you typically consist of 20 repeating modules, which means that, you know, you cannot really use every vector uh, that is currently used for, um, for delivering them into target cells. Whoa. So what about CRISPR? Last but not least, it's been in the news so much lately. You know, what is CRISPR and how is it different from these other systems you've told us about today? So CRISPR, which stands for Cluster Regulator Regularly Interspersed Palindromic Repeats Cas9 System. Whoa. Is, yes. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. So we're very grateful for the CRISPR acronym. <laughs> but you know what? CRISPRs are revolutionary. They are very easy to design and amenable to multiplexing. The CRISPR-Cas9 system is revolutionizing gene editing, but there are still some specificity concerns that need to be resolved. CRISPR-Cas9 is the simplest gene editing technique uh, to date and has truly changed the, the field. Based on the adaptive immune system of bacteria and archaeobacteria, CRISPR-Cas9 systems uses short RNAs to direct the nuclease, Cas9 protein, to target DNA sequences. Cas9, just like the FOK1 endonuclease that is utilized by zinc finger nucleases and talons, is a nonspecific endonuclease that creates double-strand breaks. What sets CRISPR apart from other techniques is the simplicity. Because it uses RNA instead of a protein to target the uh, nuclease activity, CRISPR-Cas9 can be retargeted by simply synthesizing or ordering a new guide RNA, or gRNA. The RNA guide also makes these techniques amenable to a high-order multiplexing, large-scale screens that were before not even thinkable. 
using hundreds or even thousands of guide RNAs in a single experiment. Wow, CRISPR sure, you know, it really sounds like the perfect tool for gene editing. But, you know, are there any drawbacks to using CRISPR? Of course. Oh. The current CRISPR-Cas9 systems, just like the other gene editing technologies I talked about, still pose a number of formidable challenges, including its size. The commonly used uh, Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9, for instance, is too large to be accommodated by an adeno-associated uh, virus, or AAV. These are delivery vectors which are very popular for gene therapy because they integrate into a known or safe harbor site in a chromosome and have an excellent safety profile. A second major constraint of the CRISPR-Cas9 system is its requirement for a species-specific sequence, which is called a protospacer adjacent motif, or PAM near the edit side. This limits the sequence that can be edited using a single organism's Cas9. Lastly, off-target edits are a concern for any gene editing system, but especially for CRISPR-Cas9, because it tolerates positional as well as multiple consecutive mismatches. Got it. Well, thank you, Jan. That's been a great overview. And thanks for listening, folks. We hope you enjoyed learning about the four main gene editing techniques currently in use by life science researchers. Please look out for other podcasts from our bioradiations team here at the BioRad headquarters, where we'll be covering a range of other interesting life science topics. So it's bye from me and bye from Jan. So long, Laura.